Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Kelsey Livingston. This is Artists in Residences, brought to you by Baton Rouge Gallery. Um, this is a weekly webcast where we uh, interview artists of all kinds um, from our artist membership and from the community. Um, I just want to, before we get started, I just want to say a quick thanks to all of our members and donors um, and to our partners over at Breck who have helped us make our home in City Park. Um, thanks, everybody. We really appreciate that. And I hope that you're all staying safe and dry on this rainy, rainy Tuesday. Um, today's guest is an artist member. Her name is Libby Johnson. Um, she is a new artist member to the gallery, sort of. We'll get into that in just a minute. Um, she is a longtime community member. Uh, many people will know her by her work. And without further ado, I am going to go ahead and bring Libby on. Libby, hi. How are you? Hi, Kelty. I'm fine. How are you? Uh, I'm just trying to stay as dry as I can and keep the dogs from cowering in the bathroom whenever it's thundering. I'm right now, so. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good not running around the, the house barking, but yeah, yeah. The audience, I'm sure, will be used to my my bloodhound uh, making the occasional appearance. Uh, oh, you you're, know, you audibly. Have I have a bloodhound and a pomeranian. Yeah. Oh my gosh! What a mutton jeff situation huh it's <laughs> <laughs> you know i have one of those pomeranians that has that kind of longer foxy face so it's a real fox and the hound kind of kind of friendship they have going on nice. yeah um <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, anyway, so I wanted to bring you on today so that we could uh, talk to you a bit about what we do and um, just audience, just so you guys know, we are actually live right now, both on our Facebook and on our YouTube pages. So if you would like to interact with us, comment, ask questions to either me or Miss Libby Johnson here, you are w more than welcome to do so. We can put those on the screen and respond to you in real time. So please please feel free to, to comment as we as we go along. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up some artwork by Libby so that we can get going. Okay, um, so when I look at your work, I would describe it as moody, but not in like, you know, like a, in like a mysterious way. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what you do to get started? Um, you're breaking up a little bit, Kelsey. I, I, the last thing I heard was moody. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, again, with the rain, uh, it might be a little a little choppy. I hope the audience forgives us. Can you hear me okay, Libby? Okay. Um, so tell us a little bit about yes. what you do. I, I really couldn't hear that, but... If you want me to just talk about a bit, um, yes, I will. So, yeah. is that yeah. what you're basically saying? Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, this painting chose to be the first because um, it kind of um, illustrates a lot of the ideas that I've been working with for years. And um, the first of those is being um, sort of a figure ground idea, which I have been very, very interested in actually since college when I first found out about it. I've always been a representational painter, um, but you know, before, before you find out certain things, um, I guess for representational painters, you know, you're trying to just make something look like something, you know, and there's just so much more to it than that. And when I was in college in freshman design class, I, I was introduced to the idea of figure ground. And I just want to tell you, it changed my life. And, um, you know, not to think as a foreground and a background, but to think about the bisection of the picture plane and have that be as important as the um, subject matter. And the subject matter, of course, is always there. It's really strong because then we notice in nature. Um, so you have to kind of, you know, push that to the background a lot and just think about how to bisect the picture plane. And in this case, um, the shapes of the trees form 
these sort of um, background shades in yellow and pink and whatever. And um, to me, those are as interesting as the trees themselves and that they're, you know, the, the line of the tree makes the line of the background or foreground shape if you're thinking pure figure ground. So that to me always, and every painting is, is extremely important about how I chop those shapes up and make uh, different colors out of different shapes. And the horizon line is also extremely important. It's, it, when I do a landscape painting, I'm moving that line up and down a whole lot before I just fix on something that is, I guess, just intuitive in where it's supposed to be for me. And um, so that's another factor. Um, I had a teacher, Paul Georges, who, who said that if you make the horizon line, it, it makes everything that's above the horizon line much more um, majestic as though you've got a very low eye level and that you're looking up at all this stuff. Whereas if you're looking down on the ground plane, you know, you, you are as high as whatever you're looking at. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if you can hear me, Libby. So I think about that a lot too and whatever it is. And this painting, this painting is, and it is actually, um, this came from a photograph I had done of Ford's Pasture. And I know Ford's Pasture doesn't mean anything to anybody, but it's, um, it's actually that pasture where all the sheep used to be. And um, that's over where Sprouts is now on Perkins Road. <laughs> uh, anyway, you know, I, I saw these shapes of the trees while I was driving by there one day so I stopped and photographed it. I pulled Harrison Paint Company, photographed it and um, that was sort of in between when it was a pasture and when it became the big complex it is now. So anyway, um, when I was making this painting, or painting actually, the subject matter is is always the last thing I think of in terms of the narration in the painting. Like in this case, it's sheep. The name of the painting is Beacon. And then the sheep are, um, sheep are, you know, the narrative in it to me. But they didn't come until the very, very end. At first, I just had the trees and the land and the, the light, the beacon. And then it, it bothered me that I needed to bring some color down from the top of the painting into the into the bottom of the painting. And that's actually how I came up with sheep. And I love to paint sheep anyway, but um, I needed a little of that orange down at the bottom. And it was so perfect because in Ford's pasture, there used to be sheep. And um, I think everybody is a little nostalgic over that. So, um, that painting really incorporated a lot of ideas that I have about visual balance and, um, you know, having a little, it, what I call is um, asymmetrical balance, whereas you have a lot of bright color up top and you have the dark at the bottom. And then you're trying to bring some of the, the bright color down to the bottom, but you don't want that bright color to take over the bottom. So you have to just figure out how strong it's going to be so that there is a balance between the colors, um, but it just feels right. Can you hear me, Kelsey? <laughs> I can't hear you. That would be because I had my mic muted and didn't realize it. Can you hear me? All right. So we're having some technical. So I'm just going to. Okay. Do you want me to just talk about the painting? 
Yeah. You'll have to nod your head if you see it. Okay. This one is called Cartwheel, and it's a, it's a very, very dark painting, as you can see. And uh, paintings tend to go dark. Uh, I actually think there's great amounts of beauty and darkness, um, and especially if it's, you know, coupled by some bright, bright colors. But again, and this, in this painting, I think this is actually, for its pasture also the same location. Never photographs. Um, but in this painting, it's like having a a stage set and a what you know what what kind of action should I put in it? And so I came up with, for some reason, some kind of just intuitive reason, I came up with the, the kids and the cartwheel because I remember doing cartwheels when I was a child. And this also has to do with that particular place reminding me a lot of my childhood. And um, the colors again are, you know, dark. I really do like the dark and the light, even though in this case it's not so light, but um, just that kind of yin-yang idea of having opposites and hopefully the um, the greens, the darks in the bottom will help out. Uh, okay. Paul Sojourn, and it, it's a photograph by son's daughter who does these just incredible this incredible eye and um she, she puts these on Facebook and asks her can I use that and, and she seems thrilled close to photograph and it's again the um there's a lot of movement and shape going on too. And um, so there's kind of two, I think the sky is really the major part of the composition. And then you have to look real closely to see what's going on in the, in the bottom. And I invented, you know, like gas stations and stuff like that and just having fun with the narration in the bottom. Um, <clears throat> so do you want to change to the next next one? Ah, this is, um, these two paintings are called November, the one on the left, the kind of orangey one, and the one on the right is called Remnants of a Day. And um, the one on the right, and I'll talk about first, because there's something just so incredible to me about that last little bit of light, you know, when the sun's going down and just one thing is illuminated and everything else goes dark. I mean, that's like just a, um, I say that I'm not a nature copier, but that, that part of nature really fascinates me. And, um, you know, it's kind of nice to have, you know, a big form idea, but at the same time of um, addressing nature so that's that's really what that painting is all about and both of these paintings really zero in on one tree it's kind of like an, an icon um, making trees into icon. the one on the left I just painting. I never ever um, use natural light. Except I'm lying. I did it in the day, but most of the time I'm painting around, for instance, the, the light painting there just to make a yellow shape behind that tree. And then the, another yellow shape up underneath, a bright color underneath. And I think I got 
I know I did. I got this idea from Renee Magritte's um, series of paintings. I've seen one or I've seen two at least that I can remember. One of them is called Remnants of a Day, and it's a, a little building, like looking like a European building, with the um, the lamp in the front, the lit lamp, and it's kind of a night scene. But then there's this blue sky behind them. But the, the good part about that painting and what I learned from it is that it's it's a surreal thing, but it's very subtly surreal. You know, it's not watches that are hanging off of whatever. You know, there it's um you don't really notice it, but there's kind of a subliminal unease to it. And so that's what I'm always looking for. I saw those those two paintings, once in Houston, and once the um, in home collection, and it blew me. You know that you could have something, and um, it you almost don't notice it, but you, there's just a little funny feeling of something not totally making sense in it. So um, that's that's what the November painting is about. An homage to Magritte, I guess. And a lot of my paintings do that. This is, um, this is called Crossing. And um, this is the LSU Lake, if you're looking over toward the sorority, sorority houses, and it's that little bridge that you go over. This is all stuff I see a lot in my life. And um, the, the shape canvas came about, I guess, in the mid 90s I started doing shaped panels and they were they were something that just came into my mind this happens a lot to me I meditate a lot and sometimes I'll just get these images pop into my mind and that's how the, the idea for getting those shaped panels came from and I'm sure I've seen some you know I, I know I've seen altarpiece shapes you know so you don't know why that's popping up or you know what part of your subconscious it's coming from but um i did a whole bunch of these even triptychs but um the reason i did them i think and the reason it was so exciting to me was because it also activated the wall around it so i had a new figure ground idea to deal with not only what's going on in the painting but what the, the shape of the panel is doing to the wall. Um, and that was very exciting to me and it sustained me for probably 10 years. And um, I don't really do these anymore, but it was fun while I did them. And of course you've got the figure ground idea going on in the painting itself. And again, the, um, the bottom part has little teeny um, reflections in the water that kind of bring the sky down, the brightness of the sky down. And I just, I, I love the um, the shapes in the sky, those little blue shapes. It just, just very fun for me. <laughs> this is called Intersection. And um, it seems to me that sometimes when I make the horizon really low, like this one is and there's more sky even though it's kind of a simplified sky it's not real terribly busy but there's like some real real narrative interest to me that i put in the in the narrative part of the painting which is the intersection and the little cars i don't know if they show from here but um there's a little hint of a stop there, but there's, you know, it looks like these cars get ready right, to crash into one another it really, at the intersection. So it I really know, does. No, it kind of reminds why. me of. <laughs> it reminds me of Edward Hopper a little bit. Ah, you sh Edward Hopper was a huge influence on my paintings. You know that kind of loneliness idea and um that's that's something that's always been with me is that um 
kind of just feeling alone in nature. And it's, it's um, I don't know, it's always been there. And he kind of, that's kind of a psychological thing that I think he instilled in me even more. But the main thing I looked at him for in school was color because I was a terrible, terrible colorist for a long time. And um, my teacher, Edward Pramlick at the time, told me that I should just copper, copy Edward Hopper paintings <laughs> until I, I ridded myself of, you know, that horrible habit I had of making everything kind of uh, yucky, lavender and pinks, and it was just horrible. So, um, yeah, Edward Hopper is, is very big, and it's, I, I like that you noticed that, Kelsey. This is a fairly recent painting, and um, this is kind of a, a, I don't know what to say, it's a band painting. It's got a white band, an orange band, and then kind of a pastel-like sky to it, which I, I enjoyed the, the idea of the bands going across. And um, I really got interested in painting that lacy stuff on the on the tangerine. It was um, a lot of fun. And again, you know, it's getting back to that idea of you've got to think about, you've got to think about the abstract elements of a painting as much as you do the um, representational parts, the parts that are, um, you know, recognizable in nature. And so this painting to me is, is it's a real simple painting. It's the bright orange in the middle and the stark white at the bottom and um, then the real soft, soft sky. It's like, it's just three bands of things doing different things. And uh, that was, that's my initial idea with paintings is that kind of underlying abstract structure of a painting where you do that before you even do the do the um, subject matter. I mean, it's it's got to be just as important, or I think the painting's not going to be as pleasing to me. And with these still life paintings, I was also trying to get into the idea of this kind of solidity and and weight um, to the paintings where they're the one part of the painting is solid and heavy and sitting and and getting the the gravity on it and then the rest of the painting is just totally um you know flux the sky is just moving and soft and one minute it's going to be one thing and the next second it's going to be another thing and you know comparing that to that real solidity of the objects which is something that really excites me too. This is another version of that where um, I just kind of zeroed in. You know, I really talk about abstract versus um, elements of nature or, or the illusion of nature. This one, I, I really just got carried away on the illusion of nature by painting the inside of that tangerine. But still, hopefully, you know, there's three circles there. There's, I think, a nice uh, shape in the top and, and a nice shape at the bottom. So that's ever present, too. This is a painting that this, it's the same kind of idea of the strips, but instead of the white, I've got the... Um, the peaches as the real focal point in the painting. And then every every other part of the painting, the bottom and the top, relates to the color of the peaches, uh, either the, the inside of the peaches or the red. So that was the um, initial idea of, of kind of a unified uh, painting, but still having that flux in the background and solidity in the foreground, which is, going on in the next painting too that you flip to for a second 
that painting, um, I just kind of got carried away with all the shapes and the fruit and the vegetables and everything. And, um, you know, there's kind of a, because it's so busy, there's so many objects. There's, there's a little bit of movement in the bottom part of the painting, but not like the movement in the top. I mean, the, the fruit and all that is still solid and sitting on the table very heavily and the sky is just oof, wish you know going away um what i was going to say i hope you can hear me is that the movement in this piece seems to me to be created by the color temperature going along the the fruit that's a little bit echoed but reversed in the sky and i think that was a really smart and interesting way to go about it it kind of reminds me of um like Dutch still life paintings. I'm trying to look for like the bug or the rotten piece of fruit or something in there. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, yeah. I've, I have actually painted rotten fruit before, like on the inside of cantaloupe that are just kind of mushy and, and I really like that too. Um, and I do look, look at Dutch still life. So yeah, all those things you're seeing, Kelsey. Oh, that is, um, this is called shade. Um, I have a special relationship with the eggplant in that I, I can't seem to s swallow a piece of one. It's kind of an allergy thing or something. But in this painting, I mean, I think the focal point is actually the green and maybe the white highlight too. But the green is like nothing else in the whole painting. And so I really wanted that to stand out. And then the rest of the painting is sort of um, relating to other parts of the painting, you know, in color. And of course, there's that huge, heavy eggplants hanging on the string. That comes from Spanish still life painting, too. Um, and then, you know, related colors in the background. Yeah, so this one, I have, I feel like I have a million questions. I have a lot of questions about this piece. Because for me, okay. this one reminds me of Magritte the most. And I think that it's because mm -hmm. of that string holding the eggplant up. It's just so, like, just so, you know? And it's, it's, it's like a weird juxtaposed, like, eggplant in front of this big open sky. Why is it there? What's it hanging off of? What does this mean? Is the eggplant a person? Is it, what, what, is this a message? You know, like, I have so many questions about this painting. Well, you know, it really is not a message. It's really, um, I like big solid shapes surrounded by skies or, or skies are a way to get a lot of kind of color and soft color and um, that's not solid, something different from the eggplant. And the only way I can do that <laughs> was to hang the fruit you know, and um, I know it sounds, you're probably expecting there to be some like deep, dark meaning to this, but the, the meaning is just having that dark, solid shape in the midst of all that flux. That's what that, it, it's, I never get attractive initially to any kind of narrative idea. It's always totally visual. I see something or I think something and I have to get that. And then sometimes it implies other things like some kind of narrative or some kind of, um, like it's a symbol for something, but it really isn't in this case. I usually don't do symbols a lot. Got I'm, it. I'm kind of just bare bones, you know, give me those color relationships and shape relationships. And that's Life is complicated but, enough. Yeah. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, um, is there, th thank you. Thank you for, for going through this with us. Your work is just beautiful. Um, is there a place online or where people can see your work? Yes, um, LibbyJohnson.com. Perfect, thank you.
Um, you can also see more of Libby's work by visiting our website, Uh We have a whole section with our artist members' work. Libby Johnson is under the artist tab. Um, so Libby, do you have any final thoughts before we cap off the broadcast? I don't think so, except that I really enjoyed this. It's always good to talk with her because you realize things that you didn't realize until um, you talk about your work. Right, right. Well, Libby, thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. Again, your work is incredible. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you, Kelsey. Okay. All right, everybody. That has been Artists and Residences. Thank you for tuning in. We will come back next week with another artist interview. Take care.